how Little Soya has taken a soy sauce brand and competing with the big guys. Welcome to Global from Asia number 98. Welcome to the Global from Asia podcast, where the daunting process of running an international business from Hong Kong is broken down into straight up actionable advice. And now your host, Michael Michelini. Welcome to Global from Asia episode number 98. I want to start today off with our thoughts and prayers for those in Tianjin, China. Quite a tragedy there with the massive container ship explosion last Wednesday night which is still pretty unreal to me just watching it on videos as I'm a four-hour flight or more away. But my friend and guest on this show, Russell Smith, back from episode number 81, was actually in the building complex next door. He's totally fine. I spoke with him on Thursday uh, on WeChat, and he was evacuating as he felt all these burning uh, materials and chemicals was, was potentially not good for him. So I believe he's on his way to Thailand now. Let's keep our thoughts and prayers in for the firefighters and everyone else that were in Tianjin for that uh, explosion. It's really, really a tragedy. We got Russell on the line here. Um, thought it would be pretty cool to patch you into our our show today just to, to hear the... We've, you know, I'm sure people, have, listeners have heard on the TV and we've seen some video, but you were, were, uh, there, right? Sure thing. Um, so I was living in one of the, if you've ever, if you've seen the videos of the explosion, you can see the flames crashing down over some apartment buildings. I was living there. Basically our, our apartment block was about 900 meters from the center of the blast. And, you know, we were lucky to be honest that the, we were like six or seven buildings back. The ones at the front were torched, like blown through. And honestly, like um, my wife, all the, all, the, all the local people, they've got together in, in WeChat groups and they're trying to find the people who lived in the front and, and most of them haven't been accounted for, which you don't hear about on the news. Like they're not really, I think they're playing down the numbers. Anyway, most of those people haven't been found. We were lucky, like our apartment faced actually away from the blast. So we didn't realize, actually we had no idea what was happening. I'll go from the top, it was about 11.30 at night and we were just sat watching uh, some TV shows. And the first thing we heard, it sounded kind of like thunder. And I just remember thinking, you know, oh, that's a bit weird, you know, it's not. But then a few seconds later, boom, there's this huge explosion. And I just thought, what the, what could that be? Like, there's no explanation for that. I thought, is someone's gas gone? Or it sounded like a bomb, you know? It sounded like someone was attacking. So we went to the window, and all we can see on the opposite building was, like, flames dancing in their windows. And I just thought, what's happened over there? You know, that building must have gone up. Because, you know, no idea. And the next thing we knew, just earth-shattering blast. The whole building rocked. It was like the end of the world, you know? And... Uh, the building shook back and forward. The power went down. The windows blew through. Just unbelievable. And in our minds, what could it possibly be? You live in like quite a quiet area. You know, and an earthquake. So anyway, the first thing is like, we got to get out. And kind of a bit panicked, you know. And I don't remember going to I did go because I grabbed my keys, I grabbed my cash. And at some point, I made my wife get some clothes on. I don't remember, but she told me that that happened. And then I remember we like rushed the door in the dark and we were scrambling to open it, real panic. And we got the door open and when we got out into the corridor, broken glass all over the floor, the, the stairwell, the doors were just blown completely through. But actually we kind of panicked because we tried to open the door and half the door was blown off, half the door attached, but the handle was free and we couldn't open the door. And oh, no. that was the first time I was really scared really scared because we just thought oh my god but then Armenius had installed two stairwells which so we rushed over we got into there and then we realized so much glass on the floor our feet being cut so we actually made a decision to go back get our shoes and actually at that moment it's the real moment that I thought this might be the end of my life like I don't know it, no idea what was going on felt like the building was going to fall down and I just thought this is not it but we got the shoes on we rushed to the 
just so well and like it was weird outside there was like explosions and fire and we just like there's no calling what it could possibly be um except everything's just blown up anyway we just made it down the stairs I, I carried her half the way and we didn't see any other people which was really weird we could hear like shouts and screams and just glimpses out the window of all the other buildings destroyed too anyway when we got to the ground floor we saw that the whole of the front of the building had been blown out and then when we got outside it was just really weird because all the windows were blown people's belongings on the floor it's just quite incomprehensible we just kept going kept going we got out and then we got out to the front of the, the Xiaochu, and there was a fair few people out there, like a few hundred. And, you know, not too many people injured, but, I, you know, there was people with blood on them, and everyone was out there half naked. I, I, I didn't have a top. I just had keys and cash. And uh, it was weird, man. And only after that, when we were stood outside, we looked back and saw the huge plumes of smoke. And still just hadn't, what the, you know, what's going on over there? We had no idea. We stuck around for about half an hour and there was no police, no fire engine, like, what the, what's happening? We didn't realize at the time the whole area had gone up, you know? And, like, mm. the fire engines were in a different place and, and they were trying to get in because we lived near a highway, so all the trucks were coming off the highway right there and it was completely gridlocked, so, like, the fire engines and police couldn't get in. It was chaos, really, like, pretty crazy. And we were lucky, like, my parents-in-law lived across town, so we stuck around for a bit. There's not a lot we could really do. And then we, you know, we took a few friends and we went back there. And uh, first thing in the morning, 4.30, we didn't sleep. I couldn't sleep at all. We went back. We took the gas masks and we went back to the scene of the crime. We went upstairs. I grabbed my stuff, man, laptop, phone, bit of clothes, like whatever we could grab. Locked the door because I left the door wide open when we ran out the first time. Really worried about thieves going in, like taking all the stuff. But we got, like, the important things. And now the whole area is cordoned off. Like, you can't go near that side of town, to be honest. And, you know, when we walked out, we walked for, like, three foot blocks. And even three or four blocks away, the buildings are like, even on the ground floor. And there's no, like, clear path through, like, for the blast. But, like, the ground floor, all the banks were blown out and the local shopping centre for the swimming pool, like, all the cafes destroyed, man. Just crazy. Real crazy. That is like yeah, well, huh. now we're off. I've got I've got a flight. I've got a flight booked to Guayla at seven AM tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah, good thing man. I'm so, I love you alive, man. Fuck you to be alive. It's like I've been in a position before where I thought this actually could be the end of the last That's crazy. Terrifying. Yeah, I mean it'll make you uh yeah, appreciate life a lot a lot, I think, right? Absolutely, so. man. This made us think like why are we out here again? Like both of us, we're, we're free to move, location independent. So uh, we're, just, we're here because we're supposed to have family for now, but like we got to get out, you know? And we're trying to get out of family, so they're kind of stubborn. You mm. know, that it won't be so much problem. They kind of believe news on TV that like the air's not so bad, but a lot of reports coming out like about sodium cyanide yeah. and honest. So I don't know if you know much about the truth about what was it but it seems to me that actually a fire started at about 10:40. the fire trucks went in and they were there for like almost up to like 45 minutes then a huge blast and it turns out sodium cyanide i don't know if this is true or not but this is like the best like information that's out there it seems to be like when you spray water on it it impacts like, and you know they were there for 40 minutes and then this huge I don't think people it was there or something. Um, I don't know. Um, doesn't feel too good to be here now, man. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, you get, know, get out. They're of warning there. about the water. Get out. People are stocking up on like bottled water. And so, yeah, man. Time All for a change right, well, of scenery. Yeah, stay safe and hopefully, uh, hopefully, you can convince your family to make a move. Yeah, man. <clears throat> No worries. Um, words of advice, like, just check when you book into an apartment, just ask if there's any, like, dangerous chemical storage next door. So, Crazy, man. That's we're really out, nuts. out of there, man. Out of there. All right. Well, uh, thanks for sharing, Russ. Well, let's try to keep our spirits high and remember life is short and we need to appreciate every day that we are on this little earth of ours. 
So today's guest is an upbeat and fun guy to have on the show, Gary Murphy from Little Soya, a veteran entrepreneur with lots of business experience and an expert in sales, shares with us how he went from almost opening a bar in Shanghai to starting a soy sauce business a few years ago that has the big guys noticing. And also after the interview, I'm going to have a small announcement about the show scheduling. So if you want, stick with me after. Let's get into this. So today we have with us Gary Murphy, dial in from, from Texas, right? Correct. Houston, Texas, Houston, USA. Houston, Texas, USA. So yeah, we've been in touch for a few years now, uh, quite a few years, and uh, still haven't had a chance to meet. We've had some tried to make some coordinations, but uh hasn't happened yet. But glad to get you on the show today and, and dig in a little bit about about your business. And, and we can also even have a little bit of chat too. So maybe first, do you want to introduce yourself to uh, to everybody? Yeah, sure. So as Mike said, my name is Gary Murphy. I live here in Houston, Texas. Um, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. At least the last 26 years, I started I guess seven different companies during that time period with uh, five failures, two successes. And I'm currently uh, CEO of a soy sauce company here in Houston. At least it's based in Houston. Got a staff of uh, eight employees across the U.S. <clears throat> and then one full time in Shanghai. Awesome. Uh, soy sauce product that sells to hotels, restaurants, casinos, airlines, that sort of thing. Yeah. But yeah, so I've been going back and forth to China since 2002. It was my first trip. And, um, you know, I've been back, back and forth. I guess my last trip was my ninth trip. So coming up on my 10th one, which might be next month, I'm not sure yet. So awesome. if it is. If time permits and if travel permits, we can meet up. Yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah, because we've we've uh, been we've been in touch with social media and and uh, before we started recording, you were asking me. I, yeah, I came here oh seven, my first time ever. And uh, yeah, I'm usually in the south most of most of the time. I've been in the south of China, like a little bit of Shanghai and Beijing, but mostly in Hong Kong and and Shenzhen area. So cool, cool, and. Yeah. It's interesting because you, I guess you went over there. <clears throat> let's see. Um, I had just moved to, like I said, I was born in Houston, had most of my businesses here. But in 2000, late 2007, I moved to Las Vegas for a couple of years. And, uh, but right before that, I had kind of some crazy ups and downs. But right before that, I'd owned a bar and lounge in Houston sold that. And then I was going to open a nightclub and restaurant with uh, a couple of partners in Shanghai, actually. Wow. And back and forth with them, a couple of partners, they were arguing about if they wanted to open it in Suzhou, mainly for expats, or if they wanted to make it more high profile in Shanghai. And anyway, the deal kind of fell through. But yeah, I guess it was about that time or shortly thereafter, I must have saw you online and thought, what is this crazy American doing, <laughs> doing living over there? And because um, I at that time, I was about to move to uh, to Shanghai if if I was going to open that nightclub and restaurant. But unfortunately, it didn't happen. But I've still thought about it one day uh, when things settle down. But who knows? But so, I mean, even though you're interviewing me, I, I'm very curious. Just sure. Sure. What brought you to China? And then really, most importantly, how did you decide to stay for all these years? That's a long time. Yeah, so I came, it's funny you said bar. I was selling bar products for many years online, like cocktail shakers and bottle openers since 2004, um, mostly online, eBay, Amazon, my website, and I was sourcing from China some of the products. So originally, I didn't plan to move here, but I was uh, having trouble, you know, coordinating with suppliers. And it wasn't just my my e-commerce business, but a lot of people were asking me, how do they, uh, you know, how do they get the products from China too, like other bar product kind of suppliers and distributors. I was in, in the industry. I was going to like the nightclub and bar show and Atlantic City bar show and New York bar show and, and uh, networking like that. So... I came out here for a month in two, like October during a trade show season and uh, 
thought I would just come here just to, you know, take a first trip and, and get to know the place. But uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to say fell in love with, but I like the energy and, and there was just so much to learn. And I, I got friends saying, well, you could live here. I was like, I can live here? I thought you could only visit. But then I realized you could live here. So then I, I went back to the States for the holidays in 07. But then right after Christmas, like Christmas Day, the day after, I flew back to China to live. And and uh, never knew how long I would be here. But uh, it's funny now I'm like married with a kid and uh, planning a long term here. But there were some ups and downs. Like, you know, sometimes I think everybody has those China time when they can't take it anymore. And I, I thought I had that a couple of times. But I keep coming back and sticking with it. And uh, so your your family's here in the U.S. What what city are they in? So yeah, like uh, I was born and raised in the Northeast, Northeast in Connecticut, you know. But my parents retired to Florida, and I so I have family sisters like up in uh, Minnesota now. So you know, I'm all family's still in Northeast U.S. and sisters in the Midwest, and my parents are in Florida. So <laughs> I don't know what to say anymore. But usually, I guess I spent- and. Uh- how how do they take it with you living there for so long? I mean, I remember when I moved to Las Vegas just for the couple of years and I'm very close to my family. So it was, uh, you know, it was pretty hard to do, but we were in the, at least in the same country. So if I wanted to go home, it was a, you know, two and a half hour flight, but it's not quite that easy with you. I mean, after a while, they just, or even you, you, you just understand that's just part of life. And yeah, it's really hard. I'm going back in September for a few weeks so i try to make it once a year or once every year and a half or so but yeah it's really that's that's always the hardest thing you know i can deal with some of the the bad food or the you know the risks of uh you know pollution and other issues but uh yeah the hardest thing is family and and friends but uh it's it gets easier over time i don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing but uh yeah, I even but even a lot of times in the U.S., like uh, friends and family kind of get distant and don't see each other so often, even if they're in the same area. I mean, I know it depends on the family, but, you know, I, I was back about a year and a half ago and I, I was even in a city where I grew up in to hang out with people. But it was just like a Friday night party was all I could get, even though I was there for like five days because everybody's caught up in their career. And so I couldn't really even spend time with people because they were so busy so uh that's an interesting comment yeah it's like you fly back you know eight thousand miles to see people and they're maybe five or ten miles away from you and yet they're too busy exactly crazy um, but but now you've got your new family there with uh married to chinese girl and you have a new baby that i think I, i've seen online a couple of times now right yeah yeah i'm always wondering how much to share them but yeah i put some photos on there for sure so that's he's, awesome yeah a bit a year a bit over a year now so so it's a uh, yeah it's pretty awesome new life for uh for me and and i'm embracing it fully it's it's pretty cool 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 so, so your little one will be Chinese citizenship, I guess. Uh, no, we went with the U.S. Can't be both; it has to be one or the other. Okay, so born in the U.S. and then went back to China. Oh no, he was born in China, but oh. uh, but, but, but because you're, okay, interesting. I'll uh, I'll I'll catch up on that later with you. Yeah, sure, sure. I can give you the full full story, but uh, but yeah. All right, so let's let's get into business a little bit. So yeah, I'm, I mean, I've I've had you on my list to get on the show for a while. So you know, we talk about business in in Asia and China, and you know, I'm curious to to know. Yeah, I mean, there's so many businesses, and I, maybe we just focus on on the current one. But yeah, I like a little soya. I, I like. I've always been following your, especially Instagram. You have some fun photos, and it's a very visual. You're very good with the visual branding, and and. Uh, a lot of trade shows and it's uh it's pretty cool so i'm i'm also curious how did how did that so so then you were almost gonna do a shanghai nightclub or suzhou nightclub but that didn't go through and then then little soya came up or or what was what was the story um the story is and i'm asked that question a lot you know we've uh with with my company now as a fast-moving startup i guess you know we've been through 
two and a half rounds of funding. So I've got, you know, 47 investors that I've brought on a couple million dollars. And uh, so as I'm out there pitching my story and, you know, I probably pitched it 500, 600 times to potential investors. And that's probably one of the top three questions that ever comes up uh, is, you know, how soy sauce or why little soya or of all possible businesses, you know, how did that come about? And um, kind of the short answer without taking up too much of our interview time here, but, you know, is kind of what I said earlier. You know, I, I have been going back and forth to China for the past 13 years. Um, you know, when I took my first trip in 2002, at the time I was CEO of a company called Mach 5. It was a courier messenger delivery uh, legal services company. And uh, there was, a, I was a member of a CEO um, a round table group in Houston at the time that offered a 10 day uh, trade mission to China to learn how to do business with China. And I didn't, I had kind of low expectations. I didn't have any plans to do business with China. I'd only read about it in books or seen it, in, you know, on TV and that sort of thing. And I went for, for, for my first trip and kind of like you did, I kind of fell in love with the country, with the people, you know, with, uh, with culture, with, you know, learning and comparing, you know, right off the bat that it was a 5,000 year old culture or more compared to U S and, uh, then I wound up dating my Chinese English translator that I met on my first trip, dated her just by text message and email, uh, for about a year, mainly email. Um, and then, um, Went back to see her about a year later, 2003. And even though we split up at that time, she just taught me a lot about China, a lot about the culture. You know, we had hours and hours together. Uh, and I just got to learn about the country. And I just told myself at that time that one day I would do business with China. I wasn't really sure what that meant. It was just a feeling probably more so. And then kind of as the years went on, it worked out that uh, right, right after that, I'd sold that business, opened the bar and restaurant, had that for a couple of years. That fell through, got the offer to go to China uh, to open the restaurant that I mentioned. That fell through, came back to U.S., got a phone call from a friend who uh, said there was a position uh, to work in one of the big hotels in Las Vegas. And I didn't have any experience whatsoever with being a project manager of a big hotel but my friend said, look, you got business background. Just come here and interview. They'll give you the job and you can move to Vegas. So I thought, okay, sure. You know, why not? Let me go check it out. So I went to Vegas. This is in early 2007 and um, interviewed and um, thought that I killed the interview, thought that I did great. But they later told me that I was overqualified for the position. And I was like, what is overqualified? Um, I was like, just make me an offer and I'll move over here. But they um, they wouldn't hire me. But that was my catalyst to move to Vegas because there was tons of energy at that time in Vegas. This is you know a year or so before the market crash. So there was billions of dollars flowing through Vegas and they all needed products. And most of the products were from China. So I started a China sourcing company called Arisa Global in 2008. And uh, so I had a business partner in Houston who had a small office in Shanghai where he had a staff of, I think he has had two employees. And then he had just a couple employees in Houston. So they were kind of my back end logistics and I was kind of the front end. So built the website, started it out of my, you know, apartment in my kitchen table and uh, started getting some pretty big accounts from the big hotel casinos, selling a little bit of glass, granite, furniture, salt and pepper shakers, chopsticks, you name it. So, uh, yeah, so that, that kind of went on for, you know, several months and we were starting to do well and, um, bringing, uh, like I said, bringing products in, into Vegas, specifically into Las Vegas only. Awesome. We within six or eight months of me starting that company, the market started to crash. The financial market started to crash around the world and I started to lose pretty much all of my accounts. They, they were, they, they just stopped ordering except for one particular account that had, um, it was the, it was a senior vice president for Harris casinos that owned Caesar's palace casino that had wanted to find 
the best soy sauce in the world in a single use packet for huh. their for their big buffet that they were about to open. And they had hired a Japanese consulting firm thinking that they were going to find it in Japan. <laughs> Interesting. Of course, we, we, we all know that China invented soy sauce, you know, yep, about yep. 3,500 years ago was the first documented proof of it and perhaps even longer. But, uh, so they hired me, but they said the product can be from anywhere but China. <laughs> they wanted it from Japan, so they, more from a marketing standpoint than a taste or quality. And I told them up front, I said, look, I said, I can check Japan, but I can guarantee you the best product going to come from China. No, no, can't come from China. So I said, all right, fine. So I, but I did bring in samples from China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Taiwan, Thailand, you name it. And um, I found a region of China in Guangdong province, actually, that had already been making a high quality soy sauce for quite some time in a single use packet, regular sodium, not real healthy, but awfully good tasting premium and single use. And I started selling those packets to Caesar's Palace that was buying 50,000 units at a time. Or their first order was 50,000, 50,000 little single use fish packets, fish shaped packets. Awesome. And later they ordered 50,000 more. Three months later, ordered 50,000 more. And the orders kind of never stopped coming. So, um, you know, again, probably after six or seven months, my other orders were all drying up and that order was still moving along. Uh, at the time, I really wasn't going to turn it into a real company regarding the soy sauce. It was just that I knew that Caesars was ordering. Then I, I wound up moving back to Houston. Uh, that's where you know my home base is as far as business contacts and family and that sort of thing. And uh, when I got back to Houston, I was going to open like a social media uh, business consulting type company, you know, more higher level, you know, charging a hundred, 150 bucks an hour or something like that. And, uh, picked up a few clients, was kind of moving that along. And my mother mentioned to me that maybe if Las Vegas likes your soy sauce so much, maybe, you know, you might want to think about selling it in Houston. So kind of speed up the story. I want, I, I took a handful of samples to a, several high-end sushi restaurants. All of them wanted it to get to a bunch of grocery stores. All of them said, get your packaging right and we'll buy it. So I put a small investment team together at the time. I was just going to raise a couple hundred thousand that turned into a half million and hired a few staff. My father is my CFO and COO. Nice. Handles uh, logistics and warehousing. Uh, here in Houston. And then we started to blow up across the country. So we grew to about 1,800 grocery stores, maybe just about 50 or 100 restaurants. And then we noticed, you know, after about a year to year and a half, that it's incredibly difficult to make money in the grocery business with just one product. You know, everyone kind of has their handout, the distributors, the brokers, mm. uh, uh, the stores, the customers. Kind of our joke after a while was, can we make some money too? <laughs> Everyone but us. Yeah, I, I've been there. <laughs> totally. Uh, yeah, especially with with like you know international business. It's like everywhere there's you're paying out something, somebody somewhere has some kind of a fee, and especially importing and then warehousing and then, yeah, then distributions. Crazy. Uh, like, like even that, even the brief conversation that, that, that you and I had had a while back when you were going to help me source something over there and, uh, you know, I won't get into the full story, but it's like, it's like, okay, if we were able to buy that one particular size bottle, get it to the U S and, you know, my margin probably starts at about 30 or 40%. But after every, after everyone cuts out of that, you know, I'm looking at maybe 5% that I'm yeah. making, yeah. you know, so it's like. But the uh, point is, even though grocery was not profitable for us, but it got our name out there big time from, from coast to coast in, in the U.S. And uh, chefs, top chefs at restaurants, in many different restaurants and hotels were would pick up a pack of our little single-use packets and taste it. And we started getting calls for requests for a low-sodium version. 
Then we'd get requests for a low sodium gluten free version, which we didn't have either. But we noticed that the restaurants that really no large distributors in the U.S. had a single use packet of a healthier, low sodium or gluten free or non GMO product. And so we went ahead and developed that with the help of our factory in China and um, and really started to switch over to the food service sector. So today we're about 99% focused on food service. So food service, again, meaning hotels, restaurants, airline, cruise ship, anywhere where, where, where you're selling in bulk. So we've got about a thousand or so of those customers. Interestingly, a distributor in Panama started buying our 20 liter boxes of soy sauce about six months ago. So we just started selling to the Panamanian market. Yeah, so it's just kind of just grown and grown. And, uh, you know, our largest competitors is kind of an interesting comment that our four largest competitors are all, well, three of them are Japanese, one of them is Chinese, but the top three Japanese, they're old companies. I mean, compared to American companies, you know, Kikkoman, which is basically the largest soy sauce company in the world, you know, yeah. five, five billion in sales last year, you know, 300 325 years old. Uh, Yamasa, uh, you know, another competitor, they're about 420 years old, a couple Christ. billion. And then Sanjay's, you know, 230 years old. And then Little Soya is, uh, you know, approximately four, four and a half. <laughs> so anyway, David and Goliath or something here. Yeah, yeah, um, every day, every night. Awesome. Yeah, it's really there's so much so much so much here we can go on. It's a it's a it's a really cool story. So I I'm trying to think of our listeners here and you know, I think a lot of entrepreneurs like us and they're maybe wondering how would you get that how would you get those re- deals with like, you know, you sound like a pretty good experienced sales sales person, but maybe any tips on how some of these some entrepreneurs listening want to get into sourcing and trading could get get some kind of clients like that or Yeah, so like the clients that I started with in Vegas, I really spent probably two or three months of time when I started that company. As I learned from a business mentor of mine many years ago, the phrase is to become a student of your industry. And that particular business mentor of mine drilled it into our heads to study, 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 research as much as humanly possible, the market and who your potential customers are really before you start the business, not start the business and then start hoping and praying that you're going to get a customer. So I I probably spent probably three months, maybe four months of time identifying who I thought might be good customers. And then I started asking a lot of questions, you know, because, you know, in sales, it's it's the phrase of, uh, you know, everyone wants to buy, but nobody wants to be sold to. So, you know, with these, with, with a lot of these big customers, if you just go up to them immediately and say, okay, I got this great product. Let me send you my price sheet and please buy from me. You know, and then of course they're wanting to know immediately, okay, are you cheaper? Are you better? And matter of fact, get in line because a thousand people want our business. That kind of the approach that I took with these really big companies was to, if I could identify one or two of their staff that I could start asking questions. And I always like to ask the question, and this is, this is before I'd started the sourcing company, asking them the questions, um, you know, if I was to start a company like this, would you buy from me? Or if I was to start a company, if I was to start a China sourcing company, bringing in products from the U.S., what products do you already use right now uh, that you source from China that you might consider allowing me to bid on? And, you know, so it just kind of just starts the conversation with them. And then about the time that I opened the company, of course, then I went back to them and said, okay, (laughs) I've started the sourcing company. Here's my card. Here's my website. Here's my list of services. And then I pretty much said, "Um, look, I know you don't plan on switching over to me right away because you're already happy with your current source, whoever it is. But pick out two or three of your highest volume products that you'd love to save some money on. 
And uh, maybe I can save you money, maybe I can't. And I remember this one fairly high level buyer for um, for a big casino in Vegas. We were sitting in his office and I asked him that exact question, thinking that he was about to kick me out of his office because I thought he's probably tired of listening to me talk. <laughs> Instead, he says, you know what? Follow me. And we went straight to one of their kitchens, one of their large kitchens there in the hotel. We went straight to a back room. He, he probably handed me about 20 to 25 different products that they currently use that he wanted a better price on. And out of the 25, I think we wind up getting two of the uh, two, two sold, you know, of a, of a awesome. few products. So, and just to kind of segue a little bit off that, but the other super important note that most entrepreneurs forget, or most people that are starting in sales forget how vital it is to have a relationship first with whoever you're selling to before you try and sell to them. I mean, I know that we can all say, okay, I've got this great product here and, uh, or let's say my soy sauce product. Okay. I've, I've, I've got a sample of soy sauce and I, and I can go today and knock on the door at 25 restaurants, put a sample in front of them, say, Hey, I'm great. And I'm wonderful. And try me. Well, they've already been using the same soy sauce maybe for 10 or 20 years. They have no reason to switch. The price is fine. The taste is fine. They don't know me. They don't know the brand. But on those 20, if I start to develop a relationship first through social media, through an email, through going to see them, and I sometimes it can get expensive, um, and this is kind of a fun perk of my job, but I'll go into the restaurant, have dinner, have lunch, go there for happy hour, have a drink, have a, get to know the staff, get to know the chef, make sure I'm wearing my shirt with my logo on it. And then, then it's like, by the way, I happen to have this soy sauce company. Here's a sample. What do you think? Well, then at, at that point, they know you. They feel comfortable with you. And, you know, I mean, just like right, right now is even an example of us being online here. You know, if you message me out of the blue, said you want to interview me, I know nothing about you. I don't know if you're for real or you know, not for real especially being so far away, but you and I have known each other for quite some time now and at least developed a, a relationship via social media and a few emails. So at least there's some common ground there to get to the point where I'm like, yeah, sure. Podcast, um, 830, uh, let's get on and do it. So awesome. Ideas. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and you're, yeah, it's really taking things home, but I think, I think a lot of people get lazy, right? They want the easy way. And, uh, I always try, I, I'm, I'm similar. Like, yeah, I like building relationships and knowing people and, and then, and then doing business. But I think a lot of times people get do the opposite, right? They, they get excited about a product and they try to just spam message everybody. They could potentially be their customer and, and get frustrated re- easily. So, so yeah, I, I'm, I, thanks for sharing that with us. And, uh, that's really cool. So then, yeah, I mean, and it seems like a fun, fun thing, right? You get to go meet a lot of awesome people and make new friends and, and, uh, and do business everywhere. And, yeah. uh, uh, it's an interesting business to be in the food business that we're in now because, you know, pretty much, you know, like whenever we do taste tests with chefs or other restaurant buyers, you know, probably about 99% of the time, we're picked number one in taste tests, which is pretty cool. But, you know, another business I had many years ago, well, probably almost 15 years ago that I, that I mentioned called Mach 5, part of that business was legal services. So we served subpoenas, citations, lawsuits. And in that business, you're pissing people off. You're making people mad. You're handing them a, a subpoena or lawsuit to appear at court. And even though we made our client happy, which was the law firm, you know, that business, it's a stressful, I mean, all businesses are stressful. I don't care what you're doing or selling, but there's different types of businesses. So I've kind of learned over the years, it's just in, in my nature that I prefer to be in a business where you're making people happy and, and excited about what you're doing. Still hard work. I mean, it's still, you know, I mean, my, my work weeks now are down probably to 60 hours or so now, but I went for a stretch where I was 80 to 100 hours or more a week working for probably almost a year 
And, you know, a couple months ago, I started to slow down a little bit. So if you call 60 hours a week, we're slowing down. <laughs> I know, right? I'm, I'm like, yeah. I think people yep. are going to be able to, sh- yeah, but exactly. That's, that's what it takes to build a business, right? And I think. Yeah. Cool. So, so then, yeah, and I've seen your social media and you always have some, you know, fun pictures and some attractive women and that's, uh, it's, it's a good mix and, and trade shows and, and, uh, how do you, how did you figure your branding image and, and, uh, and maybe some tips on like getting some, getting some, uh, how do you call it? Like models or, or spokeswomen or spokespeople? Yeah. So putting that up front with the old sales adage of sex sales, and I know it's that term probably not used as often now, but no matter how you chop it up, just about no matter what part of the world that you're in, especially America, that does work. It only works to a point though, but with the, uh, I'll start with the branding first. So the name Little Soya Soy sauce in many countries, China, Mexico, Canada, and several others is called soya, S-O-Y-A. Here in the U.S., it's just S-O-Y. But when I decided to officially start the soy sauce company, I told myself, look, I'm about to be doing battle with multi-billion dollar old, old dinosaur companies, you know, that are that are, that are already out there. They're already established, unlimited marketing budgets, and I've got to create a name and a brand that can stand alone by itself and talk to the customer without me being there. You know, it's one thing if I'm standing there saying, we're great, we're wonderful, taste it, and here's a sample, versus just having the bottle of soy sauce on the shelf at the store or uh, or a restaurant chef flipping through his catalog and looking for a different product to buy. So Little Soya, I thought the name was cute, unique, and funny. Um, I thought it was a little bit catchy. I wanted to design a brand that had personality. And so I came up with the name and amazingly it was available. The dot com was available. The Twitter address, interestingly, was owned by a sixteen year old Korean girl <laughs> from Korea <laughs> who she her parents or family called her Little Soya forever. Huh. And I wanted the name from her. So I'd I I'd messaged her several times to get it back from her after or to get it from her and she wouldn't give it to me because she owned it offered her 50 bucks and then a hundred U S and she wouldn't listen. Finally, I had my, my Korean girlfriend at the time, write her a letter and, uh, we convinced her to give it up. Awesome. But, um, anyway, um, so even, uh, in, we're not on video now, but if someone wants to go later to our website and look at what I'm talking about, our website is little So that's L I T T L E S O Y A.com. And you'll see our brand there, which are the logo for Little Soya. Believe it or not, when I was looking for a graphic designer, I'd interviewed about 10 different Asian graphic designers. I wanted an American-born Asian Asian designer, Asian graphic designer, because that's where my product primarily was going to be sold. But I also wanted them to have Asian influence, certainly, specifically Chinese influence, and that's what I found. So I found one designer that his his expertise was cartoon illustration. And I went to him and I said, look, I'm just going to tell you one thing. And then you go back and do your drawing. And I said, I want you to combine Hello Kitty and Wendy's. <laughs> the, Wendy's the Wendy's. Uh, Wendy's hamburgers. In the U.S. So because I wanted to merge the iconic American brand with the iconic Asian brand and uh, our Asian logo. And that's what they did. Cool. So from, we put the name together, we put the brand together, put the colors, uh, you know, the green, uh, which green is, signifies, you know, uh, healthier, uh, eco-friendly, that sort of thing. And then in the beginning, especially, and you are right to notice the pretty females, uh, we used to call them our little soya girls. Most of them I met online on Twitter or on Facebook, or I would see them on Instagram uh, there was this one girl, she had like, uh, I don't know, 50,000 followers on Twitter at the time. Today, I think she's got like 400,000. On Instagram, I think she had fifteen or 20,000 followers. And I, I noticed that it seemed like all she did in her pictures was uh, repping different products. But they were all cool products. One was um, 
um, some uh, surf shirts or, or um, surf or skateboard uh, company. Uh, another one was a liquor company. Uh, one was uh, athletic apparel, another um, protein drink or healthy supplement type company. So I just contacted her and said, hey, if I send you some product, uh, would you be willing to take some pictures with our product? And she said, yeah, send me some shirts, send me some product and send me a check for $250. And I thought, okay, I mean, I didn't know her. I didn't yeah. know. Okay, I'm going to send this girl 250 bucks and a bunch of free product. And I'm never going to hear from her again. <laughs> and, uh, so, sadly took a chance, but I had communicated with her for a while and felt that she was kind of, or should be one of our first folks models. And uh, it worked out great. So she immediately took pictures out with friends at restaurants out on the weekend. She'd eat at a restaurant. She would have our shirt on, have one of our little single use fish packets. Like she was using it. She'd have her friend take a picture and she would post it. And then she would tag that all over the place. Awesome. And then copied that same thing that that was, she, she was in Miami. And then my second one was in um, LA. Who's actually a stunt girl there. Huh. Um, it was unbelievable. I'll send you her link to her later. Her, um, her, her, um, her stunt woman name is um, Peppa the Hot Steppa. <laughs> <laughs> How do they come up with this stuff? It's awesome. I don't know. Yeah. So she's been in like Nike commercials, Doritos commercials, um, a couple of different airlines, uh, the big insurance companies, and uh, she's just awesome. And she's uh, she's uh, she's Chinese by background. Uh, actually, she actually she's she's half Chinese and half white, so it was just a, or half American, so it was just kind of a good mix there. And then we just kind of kept that going, and uh, and then even hiring staff in the beginning, it worked out that really my first sales rep uh, was a gal named Crystal Lee. She now represents us up in New York, but she had already done modeling in the past. She was already quite attractive. She was already um, had a great attitude. Because, you know, it's one thing hiring models or for social media that are going to take a picture, smile, people are going to see it and, you know, hopefully want to buy your product. And it's a totally different thing to have them working for you. They can't just have the looks. They've got to have the looks and the brains, too. And so luckily, Crystal had that. And, uh, and then a couple other employees after her, I kind of worked it the same way. And, yeah, as far, so as far, as far as the brand goes, we... We just wanted a brand that was fun, that was, you know, like I said, personable and could speak to a customer without us being right there in front of them. Cool. No, I think you're doing a great job. And yeah, it always, I always like your, you guys are always creative on your, on your posts and it, it gets my attention too. So, so definitely, I think going the right way and we'll, we'll try to link up some of those, you know, social media and, and other yeah. things we talked about. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess we're kind of, I, you know, you're really busy, so I, I really appreciate your time. Uh, so maybe a tip for somebody want to start out like international business and maybe trying to build up a brand like, like you've done, what, what would they do maybe to get, to get started or on the right track? Um, so several quick things. Um, I know, I know some of this is somewhat cliche, but I would really start off with, focusing on what they really like, what they really enjoy. And I know this is so old school to say it like this, but it's, it's really about getting a white sheet of paper and a pen or pencil and just sketching out on their, you know, notes on what, what direction you think you might want to go, what products you think you might want to sell, what service you might want to be able to offer. And on that, or so if you've got your laptop up and it's your Apple or whatever it is and you're, write your notes on there that's fine but it's just kind of a uh, free form thoughts so instead of picking one particular industry or one particular product or one service and just going for it you know really spend some time spend a couple months time researching and especially if possible I know people don't believe me often when I say this but find someone who's already doing it and go talk to them find out how hard it is Find out how well they're doing. Find out how big they are. Find out how profitable it is. Find out, you know, um, how they got started. And you'd be so surprised to find out how willing people are to talk about their business 
And I mean, just like this conversation here, I mean, yeah, I am busy, but I didn't mind taking out an hour uh, to tell you about some of my history and how I got started. Uh, some of the information some people might say is privileged or even confidential, but it it's, it, you know, it's kind of already out there. So, so, you know, if I, if I had not started a company before ever, I would also be really, really careful how much money it costs to start a company and do your absolute best to, I mean, there's, so there's two different ways to go about it. So you can start off small and kind of like I did with Arista Global that I mentioned when I opened the China sourcing company in Vegas, you know, I, I had a website built for maybe a thousand dollars us, you know, had some really nice business cards made up and I just went out there and made it look like that I already had an established company. And, uh, you know, my invoices that I had for customers, it was just from some office, some uh, online site. That's one way to do it. And then the other way, which is the much more expensive way that I did with Little Soya, you know, is looking for investors to raise money, which is extremely difficult, very time consuming. And, uh, you know, if you're recently married or have a newborn like you do, you better have a wife who believes in you and mm-hmm. you can okay. cut off for a long, long period. But um, yeah, so I guess just um, to kind of sum that up to, um, to, to just really focus in, in, in the beginning on just spending time researching. Don't just jump into it and do it. Got it. That's, that sounds, that sounds good. But at the same time, you know, some people never stop researching so I think there's got to be a little bit of a balance to to to. to. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, that's another thing that I learned from a business mentor of mine many years back. That whatever business that you're going to start, or whatever product that you're thinking of launching, or service, or whatever, it's never going to be perfect. And especially if you're somewhat of a perfectionist like I am, you can get caught up in that and get too focused on the detail of whatever product or service that is. And one thing I've learned is, you know, I have a, you've probably heard me use the term business mentor several times in this conversation. I probably have about six or seven different mentors that I've picked up throughout the years that are basically go to guys that have already been in business 20 or 30 years. They've already been down the roads before. They've already been down dead ends. And that's what I want. I want someone who can tell me where the dead ends are. I want someone who can tell me where the landmines are so that I don't have to experience what they experienced. Because, you know, like quite often people will ask me, you know, the right recipe for success or the right recipe for business success. And, you know, I can't often tell you the path to go down, but I can tell you the path not to go down. So, yeah. So, but, but, but to your point, yeah, you know, if you're going to spend a couple months research, that's fine. Sometimes it, it is just like um, Apple, the Apple company. You know how they are sometimes, or even other computer companies, Microsoft even, you know, heck, you know how it is. I mean, they'll just put a product out there in the beginning and get a flood of customers telling them this is not working and there's an error here and this is not, well, that's how they learn. Yeah. And they perfect it and get it better and better and better. So sure, spend time on it, but don't get it to the point where it's perfect. And then you're going to, because then you're going to start missing customers. Exactly. Number one goal is to uh, get the money in the bank, right? Yeah, I think that's that's when I think a business is started is when the first customer pays, right? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you can talk all day about it and research all day and be online all day and all that, but until money changes hands, you know, nothing else matters. And once it does change hands, and once you see it hits your bank for that first time, that makes it all worth it. Yeah, it's such a great feeling for that. New business when it's yeah, validation is money in the bank for sure. Yeah, definitely. Okay, Gary. So yeah, again, I know you're. I really, really, I'm. I'm yeah, I really appreciate your sharing today. And so we know LittleSoya dot com for people to check out it. And then you're you're pretty active on social media. And how how can people maybe reach out to you or should you just go to website or what's what do you? Yeah, yeah there's several ways. Um, Probably the easiest would be through the Little Soya website in the U.S. I'll be on Facebook, and you can find me on, it'll be uh, facebook.com 
forward slash Gary Knows. So that's G-A-R-Y-K-N-O-W-S. I'm also on LinkedIn that you can find me on. Yeah, we'll link that on the notes too so that people can get it. Awesome, Gary. So thanks again and enjoy your, your time in Houston. All righty. Thank you so much, Mike, and I'll talk to you soon. Okay, great. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks for coming on, Gary. Really appreciate it. And I know entrepreneurs out there are going to get off their butts and start taking some action from this. So thanks again for sharing so openly. And if those that appreciated it, please don't be shy and reach out to Gary and give him a quick thanks. Also, maybe tell your local restaurants to start carrying the Little Soya brand. Let's, let's get this thing rocking. Okay, now for a quick announcement. I've decided to make this show be every other week. I just want to make sure I keep the quality of the show as high as possible and keep my momentum going. Many listeners are enjoying the show, but say they have trouble keeping up as it's so many episodes every week. So I am also keeping having trouble keeping up. And I thought if listeners are overwhelmed and I'm overwhelmed. Let's maybe just turn it down a little bit. So I'm going to do it every other week. And uh, I'm looking forward to keep going with the show. And it'll be still on Tuesday mornings, 10 a.m. Hong Kong time, just every other Tuesday. Also, I'm pretty busy preparing for my U.S. trip. I'm going to be busy trip landing in San Francisco on September 11th at 9 a.m., a couple of days there, Florida, most of the time until September 24th, a few days in New York and Connecticut until the 28th, and then back to China on September 29th. Yeah, I know it's going to be pretty hyper. I'm used to doing this on my own, but now with a wife and kid, it's going to be a, a new experience, so wish me luck. All right, that's all we have for today's show. Thanks for being here with me, and I will see you in two weeks. Time to take Miles off for a bike ride. He loves bike rides. Bye-bye. To get more info about running an international business via Hong Kong, please visit our website at www.globalfromasia.com. That's www.globalfromasia.com. Also, be sure to subscribe to our iTunes feed. Thanks for tuning in.